hall. Uh, thank you very much, Aryan. Back wall, front hall for networking and communications. Um, in this particular workshop, this uh, that that you're attending today, it's uh, it has been technically sponsored by IEEE Communication Society okay. Emerging Technologies Initiative, back okay. wall, front hall. And uh, it has been also supported by IEEE Communication Society, local chapter, UK and Ireland. We have a fantastic set of speakers today. We will talk about various emerging technologies and initiatives that would perhaps shape the future of the wireless communication networks. So please stay tuned. Uh, during the first set of the talk that will last from now until 11.30, will be moderated by the Dr. Aryan Koshik from University of Sussex. And from 11.30 till 1 p.m., the next session will be moderated by Dr. Muna Jaber from Queen Mary University, London. Uh, Aryan, I would like to hand it over to you, the session to kick a start without any further delay. Uh, thank you very much for attending today. Please engage with the workshop and uh, follow the program for the rest of the uh, uh, for the rest of the day for next uh, three hours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dishan. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so without further ado, we will start with the, with the, with the first speaker, first distinguished speaker we have, uh, Professor Marco Di Renzo. Um, so just a bit about him, just a bit of intro. Um, he's, he's a CNRS research director and a professor uh, and the head of Intelligent Physical Communications Group uh, at Barry Sackler University. Um, he has had many awards. He's a fellow of the IEEE IET as well. Um, and he's he has served as the editor-in-chief uh, of IEEE Communication Letters as well from 2019 to 2013. Um, so I welcome Professor Renzo. Um, his title of the talk is Reconfigurable uh, Surfaces for Wave Domain Communications. And we look forward to hearing uh, from him on this important technology um, and see the latest updates as well from his group. So I welcome um, Marco. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Harian. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Zishan, for for um, uh, for putting together. I mean, uh, this uh, online event, and uh, also I mean for for inviting me. So it's a great pleasure to be to be part of the many events that you that you organize. So I'm. Uh, I very like that. So thank you very much for that. And uh, so I will try to share in the next uh, half an hour the some um, uh, new results that actually I obtain in this field of um, reconfigurable, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. So let me start by uh, sharing my uh, slides. Okay, so hopefully uh, now you should be able to see my my slides. Uh, so I will uh, maybe skip uh, some some slides in the interest of time. Uh, but um, so the um, as I said, I will be talking about this uh, um, wave domain communications, and then um, I tried to um, I will give you an overview, and then I try to make the title uh, uh, specific to one item that I will. Um, I would like to share with you with this uh, new research work. And um, so the idea of this, uh, the main message of this presentation is to show you the uh, sort of uh, um, approximations that we make in many models that we use in wireless communications, which may result in strong uh, uh, simplifications when it comes to optimizing uh, meta surfaces for um, in the field of communication theory and so the idea is to uh, try to highlight what these assumptions are and then try to show you a new model that may overcome uh, these limitations so uh, the outline of the presentation is relatively simple um, a very brief overview and then i will go straight to the uh, to the main uh, to the main content so, uh, I mean, if you are uh, not familiar with this, this technology, uh, reconfigurable surfaces in general, this might be a good pointer to, to use a special issue published uh, one year ago, and uh, it's pretty interdisciplinary, so you will really find quite a, a bit of information uh, in different fields. Uh, so, so, what we are talking about, um, essentially, 
um, there is this technology uh, which is called the uh, reconfigurable meter surface or programmable meter surface, which is something that looks like this. Um, it's a sort of poster uh, where we have a um, uh, very thin uh, in terms of uh, uh, thickness, uh, but then I mean we have a large, large size. And we have some radiating elements here in red, which are kind of tiny antennas. And then we have some reconfigurable uh, uh, devices. So um, the um, in the field of wireless communications, why this technology is uh, becoming popular? Because we can do a couple of uh, couple of things. So um, one instantiation of this technology is a RIS, a reconfigurable intelligent surface. So here the idea is that um, we deploy the surfaces uh, on the walls, for example, of the environment. And then um, we may change the um, propagation of radio waves throughout the environment. So, for example, here we should get this, uh, this reflection, uh, which could be wasted uh, by programming the surface. So we could get a reflection towards the um, uh, allocation, which may be of interest to, to us. Uh, and then there is another application, which is um, uh, using these surfaces at the, at the transmitter. So the usual transmitters that we have in mind, the MIMO, uh, we have a, a very complex baseband digital signal processing. Then we have uh, some uh, uh, DACs, ADCs at the receiver, and then maybe some phase shifters. This uh, architecture is pretty complex and energy uh, and needs a lot of energy I mean, to operate. An alternative is to use uh, uh, multiple layers of this meta surface structures that uh, operates as a sort of uh, uh, deep neural network. So we remove almost completely the digital signal processing part and we replace the operation in the digital signal processing part in the uh, wave, wave domain, so directly at the electromagnetic level. It's a DNN, uh, but uh, uh, like a DNN, we have multiple layers, which are these meta surfaces, and neurons, which are uh, essentially these red elements and the associated control circuits on the on the surface. And this enables us to uh, process the signals when they go through the, the signals and basically to do beamforming in the wave number domain. I'm not gonna. Uh, so the there are a few a few uh, differences between the uh, RIS case and the um, Olos or a SIM case. Uh, here we really think of something that is a passive, so we don't want to amplify the signals. And the other end here, the surface is, is integrated with the transmitter. So if you see it as part of the transmitter, then we do have power amplifiers because they are. Uh, this part, this part here, but we can significantly reduce the number of power amplifiers and also the uh, digital signal processing. So um, now, uh, what what does change when we um, uh, move to the uh, wave wave uh, wave domain and when we utilize these uh, these larger surfaces? So this gives you a, a picture where we combine these two things together. So uh, surfaces are the transmitter that are here in, in blue and surfaces as are reflectors in, in green uh, here. So there are two main things uh, which you can guess from this figure that these surfaces can be quite large. So what does it mean? It means that if they are sufficiently, sufficiently large, it means that what we usually we call the uh, far field distance of different over far field distance, if L gets large, which is the size of the surface, moves to the, uh, the right, which means that we expand basically the near field region. And therefore, this implies that while in wireless communication we have been primarily focusing on far field communications, if we deploy these large surfaces, we may need to update our models to include uh, near field. Uh, near field communications. That's the first point. The second point is that uh, the typical model that we use in wireless communication is this one, where we put the antenna elements spaced the lambda over two. Uh, but now we would like to do two things. On the one hand, we would like maybe to make these structures uh, compact, otherwise they may be too large. And so we want to reduce the size and therefore the elements that needs to be put uh, much closer in order to have the same elements, but in a closer space. Or we may want to densify this structure in order to be get a better effective area. And this means that the interactions between these elements cannot be ignored. So um, I want to give you an example because uh, I guess that in many engineering uh, paper, uh, papers and books, I mean, we find that uh, often this is considered to be sufficient. There is no need to go beyond, beyond that. But indeed, uh, if we consider, for example, what is written in this paper, which I recommend you to have a, to have a look, uh, 
uh, this paper considers a simple scenario, uh, which is the following. So imagine here that each of these red uh, dots is a line uh, to which there is a current, and these lines is uh, uh, parallel to the x -ax axis that uh, exit from this uh, slide. And um, and this is actually is, is an infinite surface, if you want, made of many lines. And um, imagine that you want to, you have an impinging wave here, and then you want to optimize the reflection. Uh, the, 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 the problem here is uh, where to locate this, these points, these red points on the y-axis. So what is the distance between these, these points? Well, it can be mathematically proved that if you want to radiate one single plane waves, so we know spurious reflections, the current distributions over y needs to be continuous. It means that you cannot do it with discrete elements. It means that uh, you need to have really a continuous surface to make this structure ideal, to have the best possible performance. So this is something that approximates that, that structure. So this mutual coupling is really, is really needed to get close to the optimal. Uh, so now I want to show you a model that we developed, which is based on multiple network theory, which is not a new thing, but um, it helps us understanding a couple of things. So I will skip some of the mathematical details, but I will give you at least um, a general sense of what we have been doing. So first of all, um, if you don't know what uh, um, uh, multiple network theories, there are of course uh, books, uh, etc. I guess that in, in the field of communications, one paper that uh, is uh, pretty popular is, is, is this one from Professor Nosek uh, uh, toward the circuit theory of communications. So you may want to have a, you may want to have a look on the, on the fundamentals. So now when it comes to RIS, the problem is uh, uh, try to apply this approach that is electromagnetically consistent. Try to see whether we can get something useful to analyze and optimize RIS, and then try to see whether through this approach we can get conclusions that are different from those that we get by utilizing the typical models that we use in communication theory. And I will show that this is the case. So let's start uh, from the simplest case, which is a free space scenario where uh, essentially we have this. So just transmitters, receivers, one receiver, and one RIS, but there is no, 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 no multiple, no, there's no environment. So the reference paper is this one, if you, if you are interested in the details. But um, in short, we take the RIS and we approximate it as a bunch of dipoles connected to impedances. So the dipoles are the scattering elements in red and the uh, impedances are the tuning elements. So depending on how you change the impedance, you can change the direction of, of reflection. So what is the objective uh, in, uh, in a typical MIMO setting? Because you can see this as a MIMO channel that goes through an RIS. Uh, we would like to write uh, a signal model which uh, of the, the kind y is equal to hx, uh, where x is the input, in this case the input is physically the voltages connected to the generators, and the output is what we measure on the load, uh, so the voltages on the load. And we would like to get a, a, an analytical expression of this channel, because if we know this channel, then we can compute the mutual information, the capacity, and we can, we can understand. And by channel here, we mean everything between the transmitter and the receiver, which includes the scattering elements, the impedances, the coupling between the elements, etc. So we have chosen this model of dipoles because it's mathematically tractable, but also because there is a, it, it, it is an approximation for complex structures. Okay, you may find the reference here. I'm not going to go much into the details, but this is the justification for this dipole-based approach. Now, what needs to be understood is that every time that you illuminate with your wave uh, two antenna elements that can be closed to very close to, to one another, the interactions between them, so the strength of the uh, the impact of the field generated by one on the second one, is can be quantified through this simple formula which give us the electric field that is radiated, for example, by P, the antenna P, and observed on Q, and then you project it on the antenna Q, or the currents of the antenna P. So the, 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 the stronger this coefficient is, the stronger the coupling, is, the stronger the interaction between the, the, the antennas. Uh, the antennas is. That's the only thing that we need to, uh, 
at the standard this at this stage so now i'm not gonna go much into the details but in the paper you will find a procedure and through this procedure we managed to get this closed form expression for the end-to-end uh, -end channel which may look a bit uh, uh, complex uh, but i will show you that it can be easily simplified in a, in a, in a few slides but um, even in this complex channel model we can understand three things first of all we don't make any assumptions about far field and near field it can be applied uh, anywhere so uh, we have a model that is electromagnetically consistent it can be applied to near field and far field the second thing is that uh, we can clearly identify the contribution from the interactions between the antenna elements so this is the matrix of mutual coupling if this matrix is uh, diagonal the mutual coupling is negligible otherwise it, it's strong and also we can clearly identify where there are the uh, parameters that we can optimize so these are the impedances connected to the um, to the uh, to the dipoles and, and therefore i mean this is good because here we can clearly see the impact of uh, mutual coupling and then also the variables that can be optimized in order to uh, steer the directions of, uh, of reflection so this was the the first starting point but then, of course, I mean, in wireless, we have a more complex scenarios. So we would like to see whether this approach can be applied also to more complex systems. And so I will show that it can be easily extended to multipath. And it also allows us to say something uh, very interesting uh, between what we usually do in wireless and what we get from this model, okay? Which inherently implies that the models that we are utilizing in wireless communications are not necessarily electromagnetically consistent. So now multipath means that we have a transmitter receivers and then we have scatters so this can be a wall a tree or whatever you, you want something else in the in the environment but the objective is always the same so to get this end-to-end -end channel but now in the end-to-end -end channel we need to take into account the scatters and the interactions of the scatters with the rest of the network including the ris well the details are in this paper, which was published in November. Um, you can find the details, so just, I mean, uh, a few weeks ago. Long story short, again, we apply the discrete double approximation. So uh, there are papers, this one, for example, that shows how the constituent uh, characteristics of, uh, uh, um, of any objects can be uh, approximated with a bunch of dipoles. Uh, with some characteristics and in this paper you will find also the link between the physical characteristics of the objects and the dipole approximation so now you have a, all your network is modeled as a bunch of dipoles and then if you go through the math you can get also in this case the end-to-end -end channel so we have a typical MIMO channel uh, where now I mean each term has a specific physical meaning which is given by matrices of the th those coefficients that I showed you in the previous slides. And we can make an important conclusion about uh, multipot network theory and communication theory. Well, in communication theory, usually the, the difference between free space and multipot is that we say that uh, we can get what happens in multipot by considering the channel in free space, and then we add the multipot on top of it okay but actually um, the contribution from multipath here is inside this this matrix which is in a inside an inversion of a matrix so this is not a linear an additive uh, an additive model so what we use in wireless is different with respect to what we this theory will tell us so and it also this makes the optimization more challenging because the optimization variable is inside this inversion of a, of a matrix so this is the first take the impact of scatterers is modeled in a different in a different manner. But in any case, once you have your uh, channel, you can then write the usual optimization problem that we have, where now the optimization variables are the impedances, and then you can try to solve it. Now, I'm not going to focus on that, otherwise I will not have time for the for the rest. But if in the room there are experts in uh, in optimization uh, theory. So I think that this new model opens up new opportunities for developing the new algorithms. We have been working on them for a while. This is maybe the latest paper that we that we have that is still under review. 
But um, there are plenty of opportunities to make the algorithms uh, more efficient for applications to other scenarios. So if you are an expert in optimization, you may want to have a look and, uh, and see. And the, the key point is that you see the optimization variable is inside this inversion of the matrix. So you need to develop different tricks to, to deal with that, okay? But now let's now go in the second part of the presentation to maybe the main uh, uh, message that I would like to convey. And I will skip some of the mathematical derivations because otherwise it's gonna be too, too heavy. But I, uh, I will show you a few illustrations that tells you the same. Uh, believe me that the mathematics uh, leads to, to that. I have the slides for the mathematics. So if you are interested, I can I can answer questions and show you uh, why mathematically it is, it is like that. But I mean, so first of all, the reference is this one, which we submitted just a few days ago. And it's a collaboration with people expert in uh, MIME and optimization and electromagnetics. Uh, and that because we did some validation with full wave validations, which I will show you in the numerical results. So the model that we take is again the multiport network model. So it can be represented in a general manner like that. And um, and so what is what is the idea? I will just give you some mathematical expressions. The when you have this multiport network model, what do you do? You have n ports. Uh, some of these ports represent the transmitter, like here. Sorry, like here. You have a few ports. This represents where the generators are connected. Okay. Some ports represent the receivers, so where the load are, are connected. And then there are some ports that represent the RIS. So the, the impedance is that you can optimize, that you can tune. It does, we don't care whether this is, uh, you know, uh, centralized in the same device or distributed. Your entire network is modeled as a huge circuit, okay, with these tunable, tunable elements. So, therefore, we have in general an n port network, and you can model it uh, either by linking the currents that flows on the port and the voltages through this matrix Z, or the waves that uh, are incident on the port and the waves that are reflected. In wireless communications, we typically prefer these representations, and here is where the problem is. Why? Because in wireless communications, we believe to, we prefer to use this. But if we go back slowly, um, I told you that the definition of Z, as I will tell you again, this Z is the matrix that give us the physical signals, okay? Not S. So this is the physical signals. And I will get back to you in a while, in a short. So I don't have much more time left. So, but um, the point is, uh, Imagine that you get the end-to-end -end channel by using the S parameters. By doing a lot of math, at the end, you get this formula. Now, this formula, you just need to understand this. This is the, uh, the contribution somehow related to the transmitter and receiver. This is the um, contribution from the uh, um, RIS to the receiver. This is from the transmitter to the RIS. And all this part here is the scattering, so the... the the, 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 the contribution that comes from the tunable elements that are inside this reflection coefficient gamma, and these uh, tunable elements are this Z, Z, Zs, okay? So now, long story short, we need to focus on one of the terms, which is this term uh, SRT, uh, and we can see that this SRT, um, let me go here, is uh, given by the sum of two contributions. The first contribution is the physical term, ZRT, which is really the link from the transmitter to the receiver, the physical one. But then there is also an, an extra term. What is this extra term? This extra term is the uh, scattering from the RIS when all the impedances of the RIS are connected to the reference impedance, Z0. So this is nothing else than a specular reflection. This is very, very important. And also we understand that the scattering parameters is not the same as the physical link, okay? Now, I think that I showed you too much uh, mathematics. Let me show you just some, some illustrations. Uh, I will skip some mathematics here. So consider that we have this link, okay? And then we have the direct link, which is in blue, and the reflected link, which is in, which is in green. Well, um, let me tell you this. 
let me tell you this. In wireless communications, usually we write the channel in this way. Okay. And we call this, uh, we have a HRT, which is this physical link. But this physical link has nothing to do with this SRT. These are completely different things. Why? Because the physical link is ZRT and SRT takes the physical link plus this other contribution, which is a specular reflection. This has a huge consequences on the design of, of an RIS. Also, we can clearly see that usually, for those of you who work on RIS, you know that we usually say that the amplitude of this gamma is equal to one, we can tune the phase, where even though the amplitude of gamma is equal to one, and you can tune the phase, the actual scattering is not to unit amplitude, because this term is much more complex. And also, the phase and the amplitude are not independent of each other. So the assumptions that we make clearly are not correct based on multiple network theory. And they clearly show the, the, the approximation that we that we make. Now, let me show you the big problem. You might say, okay, these are approximations, but what is the real the real big problem? The real problem is this. If uh, um, this link is present, the SR, all these links, uh, all these matrices are not equal to zero. But if this link is blocked, okay, then SRT is not equal to zero. There is still scattering, but the HRT is equal to zero. So physically, this means that there is something more uh, the, on the impact of the, of the RIS. Let me illustrate this to you. This is what the mathematics tells us, that you illuminate your RIS, your direct link is blocked. The communication theoretic model tells you that you only have your reflected link, the S parameters and Z parameter models, so network, uh, multiport network theory, tells you that you have the desired link and the specular reflection. So you have extra signals that we ignore in wireless communications, which uh, basically result in a loss of power and in potential interference towards other users, like in this, in this case. So we miss something that the surface does that we don't consider in our, in our model. But on the other end, we consider it in the multiple network theory model. And, um, and essentially, the component is this one. This one is the extra component. So let me now prove that this is true with full wave simulations. So we consider this setup, uh, where there is the transmitter that illuminates an RIS with 64 elements. And then we want to estimate what happens in a different locations. So let's just consider one of these locations, which is this one. Okay? These simulations are done in FACO, which is an electromagnetic simulator uh, based on the method of moments. So that's the uh, that's one of the main results. It's a, um, I have two, two, two results and then I close. So what this figure shows now, imagine that the transmitter is here and is illuminating the RIS and the RIS is here, okay? Okay, so now what do this uh, picture shows the power that is re-radiated by the RIS, how the RIS re-radiated the power as a function of the angle. So we can see that there is a very strong specular reflections towards the transmitter, and there is also the desired reflection, but there is this specular reflection, it's very strong. So this confirms that the mathematics is, is correct. And now the question is, can we null this specular reflection? Can we reduce the, the specular reflection? Because as you can see, it's huge, it's problematic. Well, actually, the specular reflection comes from this term. And we could try to optimize gamma S in order to cancel the specular reflection embedded into here, to cancel it, okay? So to create a, a, an opposite beam that cancels this reflection. Indeed, we did that. We wrote an optimization problem where we maximize the a signal towards one direction, and then we try to reduce the amount of power towards its specular reflection as a penalty there. We solved these problems. I'm not going to go into the details. And this is the results. In green is the same situation as before, the departing point. You can see strong specular reflection and also the reflection where we want. But then we have the uh, red and black uh, cases where we optimize this omega in order to reduce the amount of specular scattering. And we can see that we can significantly reduce the amount of specular scattering, uh, but still have a strong reflection where we want.
At the moment, we are not able to control these two things independently. As you can see, there is a reduction of this of this lobe, but we can significantly reduce the interference towards the, the specular uh, reflection. So the bottom line is that uh, even by using a relatively simple model like multiport network theory, we can clearly highlight mathematically and confirm with the full wave simulations that uh, there are inherent assumptions in the models that we are utilizing. And these new models may enable us to develop new optimization algorithms and so on and so forth. So if you want to know more about electromagnetic consistency, I recommend you to have a look at this paper, which is part of the special issue that I told you. And more recently, this paper here, where we were invited to overview on the meaning and on the applications to wireless communications of electromagnetic signal and information theory, which essentially means developing electromagnetic consistent communication models for the transmission, but also for the processing of information. because. When you have a new model, you can also develop new algorithms and also the channel estimation, for example, uh, changes. So that being said, I close here and I would like to thank you once again for uh, having me. And uh, if time allows, I would be happy to take uh, questions from, from you. So thank you very much. So I hand over to Dr. Behrouz after this. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me then? Or... Yes, we can hear you well. Oh, OK, good. So thank you very much for having me. I mean, you explained that I'm going to talk more about the network control repeaters. Um, I think compared to the previous, I mean, presentation, it's a much simpler presentation. I don't have any equations or I, I maybe just want to start for the simulation. So let me share the screen. Do you see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. So as you said, I'm working in Ericsson. I mostly work about the wireless backhaul and the network densification. And you know, when you are in the company, I mean, a large part of the work is related to the standardization effort, which di directly affects the, the products that the companies are going to have. So one of the topics that has been discussed in the 3GPP as the main I mean, source of the standardization in wireless communication and during the last one or two years is about this topic which is called as a network control repeater. So today I'm going to talk about it and then uh, very briefly discuss about what has been discussed in the 3GPP. So just a very short introduction, you know that we are in the area of the more or less 5G is finished and then you are moving to the beyond 5G. I mean, people call different names for it, I mean, uh, advanced 5G or something like this. But anyway, for both of these 5G, 6G, advanced 5G, 5G for all of them, well, the key requirement that we are looking for to satisfy is that basically we want to connect everyone everywhere with very high quality. That's a very difficult task to do. And then to satisfy such a requirement, we are looking for different alternatives of the technology. One possible method that we are thinking about is called network densification, which means that we are going to increase the number of the access nodes that we have in the area so that we can we are more flexible, we have more resources to serve the UE, and we can manage the interference more easily. The other one is about the beam forming. You know that the 5G is basically all, all about the mind or beam forming and these things to, to focus the energy and then avoid the interference. And finally, we are using high, high bands and maybe in the future we are going to even go to higher bands. But for now, the 5G is mostly focusing on the millimeter wave communication, which is normally around uh, 28 gigahertz or, or, or similar. So anyway, what we expect in the, maybe not a very near, but in the future is that the wireless communication is expected to be densified with many different types of the nodes. And these type of the nodes, for sure, they will be capable of the beam forming. <clears throat> and, uh, And many different alternatives have been considered as these type of nodes to be used in the network. One of them is called the integrated access and backcode, which is 
in short, they do normally call it as IID. And the other one which has a more recently discussed is called the NCR, which is a network control repeater system. So I shortly talk about the IID because it started earlier, and then I'm going to explain the reasons why the IID wasn't used in practice, and then what was the motivation to include yet another type of a node, which is the NCR. So here we are just talking about the relay. And you know that the relays is a very old topic. You know, it's, I don't know for how many details we have been discussing relays and phasers, but uh, it's a very old topic. And with the relay, basically the point is that we want to extend the coverage area. We want to reach areas that the normally the human being by itself cannot reach. <clears throat> so it's basically used for the coverage enhancement. Theoretically, as I said, I think three, four decades relays has been deeply discussed in papers. But the, the first try that the 3GPP did to have the relays in practice was in Greece 10 and in the, in the time of the LTE, that they tried to do some specifications and the standardization for the relays. At that time, the relays were very simple. They were fixed nodes with a single hop only communication and uh, they did some efforts but basically the release 10 or what sometimes we call it as LTE relays they have been never used in practice and there were two reasons for it first of all I mean we didn't need it so what at the beginning of the release 10 uh, what people were thinking is that the network is going to be densified a lot so we need to have the coverage extension support of the relay so it's you might have some business interest. So they did the specifications, but uh, it didn't happen. I mean, we didn't need it at all. And we could support the UEs already with the genome piece. So we don't we didn't need the relay. And the other point was that the, the release 10 relays, they were um, operating in the low band. And we know that we need the low band for the access communication for the, uh, for, to the UEs. So we don't have so much space for extra backhauling using the, using the relay. So it was a very expensive spectrum to be used for backhauling and we didn't need it in practice. So that these are the two main reasons that the release 10 relays have been basically never used in practice. Then when we came to the time of the 5G, now we had access to the mini interface band, which means that we have a much larger frequency to use and now maybe there is a motivation that uh, we can allocate part of the spectrum for the backholding when because we already have a lot of spectrum to serve the use. That was one reason, and the other reason was that the, <clears throat> you know now we are being forming capable. We can very well do accurate gene forming to protect the backholding from the interference of the UV. And now we, people were thinking was that, okay, we are going to have much more UE, so maybe now there is some business and interest that uh, we need, to, need to, to extend the area of using the relays. So these have been the main motivations that the 3GPP, in, I think at the beginning of the release 15, they tried to do some specifications for the relays, and they picked the uh, IAB, integrated access and backhaul, as the main Relaying technique for the uh, for the five G and now. So IAB is based on the decode and forward. Uh, uh, decode and forward. Sorry, I need to fix this one. It's based on decode and forward, which means that we are going to have a multi-hub networks, and then each hub is going to receive the data, decode it, encode it, and then send it to the next hub until we reach the UE. And the motivation for the IAB and the definition for the IAB is that we want to provide flexible wireless backhaul using the 3 g technology, where a node can not only provide the access services to the UEs, but it can also provide backhaul communication to the other genomes, these or the IAB nodes. So this has been the initiation of the IAB and the motivations for it. And one of the things that, I mean, at the beginning of the IAB discussion, it was always discussed in the 3 d was that we want to keep it simple. Because we had the experience of the release 10, that, uh, I mean, they became complex nodes and then no business, it was expensive, nobody used it. 
So, so when the 3G PT started to discuss about IAV, one of the goals was that, okay, let's keep it simple. We don't want to have a very complex model. But then at the end, what happened was that the IAV became a very complex model. So the complexity of the current IAV that we have in the 3 gpt is more or less the same as the GNOT. And, and the reason is that, I mean, there are multiple reasons for it. One reason was that, I mean, we want to know, we wanted the node to be standalone. This means that we wanted it to be very easy to add or remove one, one IAV node to the network. So for instance, if you have three hubs, and if you want to add the fourth hub, I mean, uh, the previous node shouldn't be affected. I mean, you should very easily add the hub and then connect it to the previous IAV and then it should work properly. This was one reason, and the other reason was that, I mean, we had a lot of root routing in the, in the IAV network, and then even later we added cases that we can have a simultaneous transmission reception, or we added the cases for the mo to support the mobility of the IAVs, for instance, when you put these IAVs on in the relay, on top of the buses or the trains to move at high speed. And we know that these are high power nodes, so they are going to add a lot of interference to the network and they need a lot of management processes. If you take all of these into account and if you want to fix them in the, in the specification standardizations, at the end, IAV became a very complex node. And the point is that currently, at least, uh, there are very, very few business interests for it. I mean, partly because it's complex, partly because there is no market. So then uh, what was people thinking that usually was that, okay, I mean, the IID is a complex node. So maybe we don't need such a node, we need a simpler node with, with much lower complexity. And then uh, maybe we don't need the, this relay node to cover a very wide area. Maybe we just need to cover a very small area which we normally call it as a coverage hole. So suppose that we want to support connections of the indoor to indoor, indoor to outdoor, or outdoor to indoor of the, of the shopping mall, a store or some area in the corner which is blocked by the, by the building and the man. The millimeter base on the signals, they cannot pass through the walls properly. So we might have a small coverage holes that we want to cover, and then to cover them, we don't need a very, very, <clears throat> very strong and complex node. We need a simple node. So these have been the main motivations that the 3GPP again has started to think about a new type of the node, which we call it as the MCR, the network control repeater. Uh, do you know the repeaters also? They are not a new topic. I mean, we have had the repeaters in the release 17. And uh, basically, the repeaters that we have in the release 17 are very simple. They just uh, receive the signal amplify and forward. They don't care what they receive. They don't have any informing. They are very simple nodes, and they are always on working. So we already had the repeaters, but the point was that first of all, they don't have any beam forming capability, which means that they are going to have a very low efficiency when we move to high frequency. And then um, they were not much under the control of the network, which means that uh, basically the release 17 repeaters are going to receive and amplify and forward the signal. I mean, we don't, without much control of the GMOT, and that is going to add interference to the network, which we don't want. So based on that, 3GPP said that, okay, let's define the node that they can do the beam forming, so they are beam forming capable, and they are under the control of the network. So these are the two key points that the 3GPP considered as a motivation for the MCR. And uh, if you follow the 3 gpp discussions, MCRs has been mainly discussed in the release 18. We started with a short study item, and normally if you are not familiar with the study items and the 3 gpp processes, study item is a, just more or less a feasibility study. We start with the wide scope, and then we make it narrow, we drop a couple of topics, and then we go to a work item, and then in the work item, we are going to do the final standardizations and then address the key points that we have been, that has been identified during the study item to be added. 
So the same happened with really PP and uh, release 18. We started with the study item about uh, CR and then we moved to the, to the work item. The work item is basically almost finished now. And uh, with the high priority, it is, has not been yet decided. It is going to be decided, I think, in the middle of the December. But there is a high priority that we are not going to have extensions of the NCRs in the release 19. But uh, I mean, this is not decided yet. But even if there is something in release 19, it should be just very simple enhancement. So the core idea of the NCR has been covered in the release 18. OK. <clears throat> So these are just very simple, I mean, definitions of the NCR. Uh, NCR is basically an enhancement of the typical, I mean, conventional release 17 repeaters, which is capable to receive and process the site control information from the network, the GNOT, and then it uses this site control information to perform the amplifier and forward delaying in a more efficient way. And uh, this has a couple of benefits. First of all, we can mitigate unnecessary interference, noise amplification. <clears throat> we can have a better spatial diversity because we now allow the, the MCR to do the beam for him. And uh, the site control information can help the MCR to, uh, to integrate to the network very easily. And of course, we can do energy efficiency, as I am going to explain in the following. So <clears throat> this is the this is the schematic of the, the typical NCR that has been defined in the treaty. So we are going to have one GNOT, and the GNOT wants to connect to the UE, but for some reasons, let's assume that we have a building or a wall or something in between, we don't have a proper link between these two. So we add one NCR in between, which is the amplifier and forward delay, it receives the data. With some beam forming, it does some power amplification. It uses uh, it uses another beam forming and then serves the U. Or in the other way, if you are assuming the opt-in, the U sends the signal. It uses some beam forming to receive the signal, does amplification, and then with another beam forming, sends the data to the to the beam. So basically, the NCR has two units. One unit, we call it as an NCR MT, and the MT stands for the mobile terminal emission. And the other unit, which we call it as an NCR forwarding or NCR and forward. NCR MT is the, basically a model, a unit which is going to touch with the GNOT, and its role is to exchange site control information with the GNOT so that the, the NCR can understand what it should do in the forward. So the NCR, based, based on the controlling, the NCR is going to receive some configuration from the GNOT. It is going to understand what okay, the time is. I'm going to use beam Y or something like this. And then I'm going to configure these two links, which normally call it a backward link and the access link. Access link is the link that the UE connects to the NCR, and the backhauling is the link between the GNOT and the NCR. So <clears throat> the NCR MT, it has more or less something like a UE functionality. It, is, it has the, the NR user interface. And as I said, it receives information for the controlling of the forward unit. The forward unit. It's a very simple unit. It has an amplifier and a couple of antennas, and it is just going to receive and forward the data in the opt-in for the down. So <clears throat> one key point here is that uh, the NCR, it is not expected to have any signal or channel awareness of the channels or the signals that it is going to forward by the NCR forward. And this means that the, the NCR basically doesn't know what it is sending or receiving. The only thing that it needs to know is, is that I need to receive the data in this direction and then forward in the other direction. What is in the signal? What it is forwarding? It doesn't understand. It doesn't need to know. And one other key point is that you know, the NCR is going to be a much simpler node. So it doesn't have any functionality that goes beyond the typical I mean, thing. So it should be a very simple node and then not more advanced complex. 
<clears throat> then uh, these are just a couple of um, considerations that the 3GPP has considered for the for the NCR. They, we call the NCR as inbound RF repeater, which is used for the coverage enhancement. It is supposed to work in uh, both low and high frequencies. FR1 is normally called as sub, sub 6 gigahertz. I mean, what we can think of in the interval. So the NCR is supposed to work in both of these bands, and it is used for different I mean, applications, use cases, but outdoors to indoors or indoors to outdoors is one of the key uh, applications that have been forcing for the NCR. Different from the IAB, IAB can be multi hop, but here the NCR is considered to be a single hop. And that's one of the points that makes the NCR much simpler because we don't have to support higher layers to for the for the routing of this thing. And the other point is that the NCR has been supposed to be a stationary node. We assume that it is going to be fixed somewhere. We don't have the NCR somewhere on top of the cars or parts or trains or the UAV. So what has been considered in the 3GPP, I mean you can see that I mean the goal has been to keep it very simple. Another point is that the NCR should be transparent to the UE. And this means that the UE doesn't understand if it is receiving the data directly from the GNRP or it is receiving it through a repeater, the NCR. The UE does what it does. I mean, it follows its normal behavior and it doesn't understand where the signal is coming. The GNRP understands if the NCR is involved or uh, in, in the communication because the GNOT is the unit that is controlling the NCR. You know, the, when we started the discussions in the 3GPP in the early 18, at the beginning, the name of the node was called a smart repeater. But then uh, at the end of the discussions, the, the, the name changed to the, to the network control repeaters. And the main reason was that I mean, the NCR is not really a smart. It is following whatever that the GNOT says. <clears throat> so most the all the intelligence has has been put in the genome tree. And then another key point is that the NCR should maintain the genome tree repeater link and the U repeater link simultaneously. This means that we are not going to have a delay in between. We don't have two extras for the receiving and transmission. We assume that if we receive the data and then immediately or very, very short delay, we are going to forward the data to the to the other side. So these are the, the four key considerations that the TGPP has been considering for the NCR. <clears throat> then, as I said in the study item, I mean, we discussed different topics. I mean, they were categorized into five different topics, beam forming, timing, allocate, timing alignment is for the transmission reception, TDD configuration, that, and the uh, on-off switching of the NCR, and finally, the power control. These are, have been the five topics that have been discussed in the study item. But then we realized that, uh, okay, the TDD configuration, that's nothing more than what we already have. So it has been dropped from the discussions in the work item. And the power control also, we didn't consider it in the, in the work item, so there is no specification about the power control, which means that the 3GPP assumes that the NCRs have a <coughs> have a fixed gain, and uh, for instance, they have, they have a I don't know, 90 dB, 100 dB gain of the amplification, and they don't change it. They have a maximum output power constraint, but uh, they don't have adaptive gain control. So there is no. <coughs> power allocation discussion in the, about the NCR. The main point that all of these uh, bullets have been doing is to tell the GNOT that in time t, you need to use beam x. This is, the, this is the key point. All of them are going to provide this information to the, geno, to the, to the NCR. And I also should mention that in the 3GPP, we have been considering two different types of the NCRs. We call them as a wide area and the local area NCR. You can think of a wide area NCR as a more capable unit. It has a higher power, probably higher number of 
so on and on. It has a very good network planning, so we assume that the white area in the earth are normally installed on top of tall buildings. So they have a very good line of sight connections to the to the green okay. Basically, these beams are perfectly fixed and planned. And then we only need to adapt these beams because the U is moving. The local area and the Rs, they are less capable ones. They have a power, they have a low power in the order of the power of the UE. And um, maybe lower number of antennas, and they are not very well planned. They might be on the lamp post or in the, in the low heights. So then what happens is that these back and the control links, they might be affected by some interferences or some <clears throat> line and outside connections or something like this. So they need more adaptation <clears throat> compared to the to the wide area IABs, uh, NCRs. So <clears throat> just a few bullets about the details of the NCRs. In simple forms, NCR is a normal repeater which has a beam forming capability. That's a key point. Then uh, you can think about the NCR as a beam bender, which means that the NCR, we can think of it as a part of the antenna of the GMOG, which we have put it, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 meters away. It is under the full control of the GMOG. It doesn't do anything by itself. Just the GMOG tells what to do and then it follows. And uh, as I said, it's, uh, it is supposed to operate in both low and high frequency, but the main motivation is for the high frequency because that's the place that the blockage and the beam forming, all of them become important. The 3GPP discussion doesn't limit the beam forming to be digital or the analog, but the main thinking behind the discussions and the main prioritization has been on the analog beam forming. And as I said, the, the coverage is the main issue. We want to use the NCR for the coverage enhancement. <clears throat> in terms of capability, the goal has been to follow such a rule, I mean, more or less, that the NCR should be a node a little more complex than the normal repeaters that we have, because now it needs to receive information as a beam for me, but it is much less complex compared to the IAB. And as I said before, the, the NCR specification, it shouldn't affect the typical UE behavior. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I don't know how much time I have, I don't see the clock, but, uh, but anyhow, just, just one more point is that, you know, the NCR has a, a lot of similarities with what uh, intelligent reflecting surfaces or the other surfaces or the reefs now in that system. Both of them are receiving the data and then forwarding it without decoding. That's the that's key uh, common post, uh, point between them. And both of them operate in the uh, in, in a full duplex mode because they don't they don't wait to forward the data. They receive it and then immediately forward it. These are the common post, points between them. So and you know that the, the, there is a big literature and the on the interest about IRS and the interfaces. So when we started the discussions about the NCRs in the release 18, there have been a couple of companies that they were interested to include the IRS into the discussion. So they wanted to have a, a broader topic about uh, to cover both of them in their study item. But then at the end, it was decided that uh, we are not going to add the IRS discussions and we are going to keep them limited to the NCR. Uh, and I should also mention that again when we went to the planning for the IRS for the release 19, it has been again suggested that the IRS should be discussed as a specification topic in release 19, but again it has been dropped. So we don't have any standardization about the IRS in release 19. I mean, what happens later, I mean, who knows, but at least for the release 19, we don't, uh, we don't have it. So as I said, it is not very obvious what is the difference between these two links. The main point is that we, the, we can assume that the IRS is an NCR, which doesn't amplify the signal, and 
it probably it has the less accurate uniform capability because the motivation for the iOS is to keep it fixed. And one more key difference between them is that the, in the normally in the, in the IRS, you only have a one uh, phase matrix that you optimize for the for the replacement. With the IRS, we have with the NCR, we have two matrices because we, we have a one receipt informing and then one transmit informing. So we have two matrices to optimize. So these are the main differences, and of course, I should mention that the, the the good point with not amplifying the signal in the IRS is that you don't amplify the noise or the, or the interference. So <coughs> that's that's the benefit of the IRS compared to the to the NCR. So anyhow, but uh, <coughs> uh, we don't have any. I mean, in terms of operations, there are, there are a lot of similarities between them, but we don't have any standardization related to the IRS. It has been mainly focused on that. So just a very, I don't know if I have. Hi, hi Barus. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we are over the time. So okay, uh, so let's yeah. go to the to the final. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, to summarize, NCR is a repeater, which is of interest in high bands. It is mostly useful for offering operations because the UEs are low power. So we need to boost the power in between if they are blocked. And then it is useful for indoor to outdoor communication. The coverage is the main point. And uh, the cell edge UEs are the UEs that have benefited most from the NCRs. Okay. Thanks. So if you have any questions, I think. Yeah, thank you, Barus. That was very, very interesting presentation. Uh, so Junaid uh, has his PhD um, and postdoc research in wireless communication at the University of London and Queen University Belfast. And he has 27 international issued patents um, related to various aspects of wireless telecommunication in the US, UK, and China. Um, and he's created the microwave and the MMW antenna business of an international company, Rosenberg. Uh, he's the general director of the company. Um, so the floor is yours, Junaid. We can see your screen. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can thank see you my very screen. much for, for your time and your efforts. Thanks. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, some of you may not be aware of Curvalex. So I think I will just say a few sentences about Curvalex. Curvalex is an international company. Our design headquarter is in Sheffield in UK, and we have a global presence. We are mainly working for the whole system and a solution development for fixed wireless access. And also some of the product could be used for backhaul also. So today I am going to talk about the green wireless network backhaul and fixed wireless access. I will talk something very general. Uh, about the new trends that why there is a need to think about this uh, topic i will also uh, i've been uh, part of the tm4 committee at c for many years uh, so i will also share some of my earlier experience uh, and i will share some of the regulatory uh, requirements also from the sustainability point of view with respect to the at uh, and then at, in the end i will talk about some of our solutions some of our product what are, we are doing it so I think the, the main thing is over here, the internet, we're talking about the digital connectivity and the digital connectivity, the one of the, of course, application is the internet, which we are talking about 4G, 5G and 6G. Uh, and this digital connectivity could be between human being to human beings or between human to machines or machine to machine. Uh, there was a time when I remember this digital connectivity was considered as a status symbol but now it is no more a status symbol, but it has become the indispensable part of our daily life. Uh, and it is not just a privilege, uh, it is a boundless source of inspiration. And uh, this is uh, basically give us the inspiration for the everyday is our work. And I think this is the thing which is not limited to a specific community or a specific regions or a specific color. Uh, I think it has become the right of everyone to have a digital connectivity now because it allows uh, the breaking of the boundaries, bridge the gap, and gap not just between the human beings, but of course the gap between the economies, between the cultures. Uh, so from that point of view, 
I'm trying to emphasize that how important the digital connectivity is becoming now. And it's not only the issue of the urban areas or the sophisticated systems, but I think it has become the need of everybody now. But the problem here is that nearly half of the world population still does not have the reliable internet connections or internet access. What does it mean? It means basically they don't, they cannot work remotely and all the COVID has already proven that. The other thing is the, there is a lack of remote education in those areas which don't have the reliable internet connectivity or the digital connectivities. The access of the telehealth, this is we have already seen in, in last few years. Apart from this, there is, of course, the awareness uh, is also very important for decision making uh, for anybody and is the right of everyone who lives on this globe to have that decision making power. Uh, online social services are not available and we know that some countries the social services are very important and we need to be of course uh, in touch. And I think one of the biggest problem which is the, the, the social exclusions, uh, the recent uh, COVID has already proven that the digital connectivity uh, availability of the digital connectivities, I think the reliable availability of the digital connectivity to all human beings is becoming more of a necessity to avoid any social exclusions. So apart from this, so this is one uh, dimension of the problem that people don't have the connectivity and we are talking about 5G, 6G and of course so on. But let's look at the facts of the life. The facts of the life is still there are about 700 million people who do not have the basic electrical power. I know last decades, the lot of work has been done in many countries, but still if you move around in some of the continent, they don't have light electricity to, to, to light the bulb there. And definitely this is one of the biggest constraint. Uh, the second issue is of course, uh, those countries which have the electrical power, look at the bills, electric, electricity bills, how they are rising. Uh, and if they are rising for your household, just imagine for the telecom networks where the main operating cost, about 20 to 40 percent is based on the energy cost, how much it is increasing. So on one side, there's a problem of availability. And on the other side, there's a problem of the cost. But there's a third problem also. And that third problem is that today also, about 36% of the electricity is produced from the coal, and I think about 26 or 27% from the gas. Now, this causes another problem, and that is basically the CO2 emissions. And that, if you just look at it, uh, from the, uh, the different segments are, of course, uh, uh, creating that issue. It's not just the information communication technology, but in one of the research which has been published, uh, just from the information communication technology, uh, about 700 million tons of carbon dioxide emission uh, annually, which is about 1.4% of the global contribution and the output. And out of this information communication uh, technology sector, nearly about 220 million tons carbon di uh, dioxide is coming from uh, basically the infrastructure from the mobile infrastructures and with, the, with, with those development and those things. And similar issues we can see even in some countries like in China and other countries, but it's not only a regional problem, it's a global problems. So now we have got few problems on, the, on, uh, on, uh, on front of us. Number one, the lack of connectivity, the digital device. Number second, okay, we should reduce the digital divide, but in order to reduce the digital divide, there are many uh, countries which do not have the basic electrical power. So definitely the system should be such that first of all, they should be affordable and available to all communities. Second, they should be available to those regions also who, which do not have the electrical power sources, which means thinking more of the renewable energy solutions, the third problem is the cost of the electricity, which means the system should be designed, whether for 5G or 6G, which should be energy efficient. So they should use less energy, less operating expenses. And the next problem is the environment pollution and all that things. And the CO2 emission is directly related to the, the, the power generations and all those things, which we are doing it. Uh, different studies have been done. So another thing is, the solution need to be power efficient. Now, all these things are leading to basically one type of a solution. And that solution is something 
different than what we have been doing in the past. So whenever we are developing any product or any solution, whether it is coming from an university or it is coming from the industry, uh, we were keeping three KPIs in our all projects. Generally, one is the performance. What's the performance you want? We should be able to achieve it. Have we achieved it or not? I'm talking the real life issues now, not just the R&D research lab, but a product and a solution going to the market. So I'm talking about something from concept to the customer and from customer to the end of the life. Uh, this is the whole whole uh, eco sack uh, which I'm talking about here. So one KPI, we talk about the performance, good, bad, cost, achieved or not achieved, the schedule, time to the market. These are the three KPIs which were generally kept in all product development cycles. But the problem which I have highlighted, now the focus is changing. And now we are talking about the 6G and all those things where we see in 6G, we are talking about not just the performance cost and uh, uh, schedule, but we are talking more than this. There's a lot of work is going on on the artificial intelligence, integrated sensing, remote and communication, but one more KPI, one more metric has been added, and that is the green technology. And once we are saying even with the integrated sensing and communication, so we are talking about the two functions now. So we are increasing the functionality. One is a sensing and second is a communication. Definitely the power requirement, if you go from the old concept, it will increase. So in order to overcome that things, a green technology has also been added. So what does it mean to us? What is our responsibility to those who are developing a product or who are doing any design work, whether in a university or in an industry or in uh, public sectors, that we need to add one more KPI in addition to the performance, cost, and schedule, and that is the sustainability. That is our solution sustainable or not. Now, as we always say that nearly the 80% of the cost of any product is decided during the design phase. The same concept can be applied that 80% ecological impact is also locked in the design phase. And what is our impact? What is our objective? Our objective is that whatsoever we are designing, whatsoever we are manufacturing, whatsoever we are using today should not have a negative impact on our future generations. This is what is the, I'm talking about a sustainable solution, not just uh, reducing the power supplies, uh, consumption and those things. So what does it mean? That the solutions which we are designing or the solutions on which we are working anywhere, it should have a positive environmental impact, socially just, and economically viable eco design. So these are the four key yardstick which we should keep in every project, in every uh, design activities or any manufacturing activities which we are doing uh, today in moving forward to the next level. And once we are talking about moving to the sustainable designs, what are the challenges? First, the biggest challenge is the problem of our mindset. And the mindset is the status quo because our industry is addicted to the mass production, fast moving disposable goods, the waste and all those things. Whereas we have seen just moving from 4G to 5G, what changes we were talking in terms of the capacities and the volume per area and, and connected devices. And 6G, we are talking about the use cases of robotic military actions, holographic integrated, we are talking about terahertz, we are talking about latencies in decimals. So definitely, if these are the challenges, which are these are the target which we are trying to achieve, and we are still in that mindset that design something, go to the market as soon as possible, and with the disposable goods, definitely it is not going to solve the problem. Now, the biggest one of the one of the variable which comes up, which we always hear a lot, energy efficiency. Energy efficiency metrics. Uh, Basically, in efficiency, just the ratio of the output and the input, right? So we are talking about that if I have to produce that much traffic, how much electrical power will I consume in watts? Or if I have to give this much coverage, how much electrical power I need to consume? If I need to give this latency, how much electrical power I need to consume? So these are the many things which we need to keep in mind during all the design and all the development work. Uh, ETSI at C and it's one of the document, which is a two to uh, eight document, uh, they've already defined the energy efficiency in their own terms. And they have defined the energy efficiency is the ratio of the data volume in a mobile network, in one mobile network, which using one radio technologies divided by the major mobile network energy consumption. 
which means how much data volume you can create in a mobile network using how much uh, energy consumptions. And that is what is the definition of the energy efficiency. If you keep that definition as an energy efficiency as per the HC regulations and the requirements, uh, definitely it will always give us a guidelines and it will always be one of the KPI in our all work when we are talking about any new solutions. Uh, some people are talking in terms of just watts per megabit per second. So for example, I can uh, create so many five megabit per second or, 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 or five gigabit per second and how many wattage of the power will I need? That is another yardstick which some of the manufacturers are start, have started using now in defining their, their systems. Now, the problem is not just the designing work. It, we have to talk the whole philosophy here, the whole life cycle of the goods and the business models, right from the, as I said, from the concept to the end of the life, which include the manufacturing and the supply chain also. It means that we need to be more focused on the recycling, reuse of the products, more efficient use of the raw materials, and of course, we, there are new regulations have come in 2021 in many countries, including in UK, that is right to repair. Right to repair means that whatsoever you're designing, whatsoever you're manufacturing, you have to give more rights to the, to the consumer so that the durability of the product can be increased. So we need to see from the all aspects, not from just from the design point of view, uh, if you really want to move forwards. And in order to do so, uh, for the information communication technology things, definitely we need to keep in this thing in our in our solutions and in our design that whatsoever we are doing it is it repairable means how the design is moving forward. Can the things can be detached or not? How long it can survive? And other thing is the raw material, the supply chain, which we are using, how much percentage of the raw material in this design can be recycled or reused? Upgrade. Upgrade could be a software based upgrade or the hardware based upgrade. Generally, the trend has to move forward that if software upgrade has to be done, there should be less monopoly of somebody to basically restrict someone to upgrade it. Or from the hardware point of view, also, the design should be set which should be more modular so that one module can be replaced and the product can be upgraded. And similarly, for the reuse and recoverability. So, all these factors need to be kept in mind, whether it can be repaired, whether it can be remanufactured, whether it can be refurbished. And in the end, we should think about how to consume the raw material which has been used in this design. So this is what uh, ITU standards and plus the Etsy already has got a lot of documents. And if anybody is interested, definitely can contact me later on and we, we can talk about it, that where to look at it and how, what from where you can get the basic guidelines and you can start including it in your design phases. Now we are talking about the wireless, the, 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 the media, right? Uh, but at the same time, if you see, we all are talking about the gigabit dilemma. Uh, there are different schemes going on in different countries, like in UK scheme is going on, the, uh, the voucher scheme and all those things. But many times what happens, whenever we talk about the gigabit, we always go toward the optical fiber. And definitely optical fiber is a good choice. I'm not going to talk about here uh, the, the issues and all those things. But in the end, we are trying to achieve a more coverage and range and at the same time high capacity, which are going opposite to each other. And then less complexities. Less complexity means that if you're designing something, which is qualifying, let's suppose, the HC standard, will it qualify the FCC standard of USA? Will it qualify the ACMA standard of Australia? Will it qualify the ANATEL standard of Brazil? Will it qualify the BSNL standard of India? So we need to think about those things, that how the same product can be used in different regions and different countries. And of course, from the cost, uh, should be such that it is affordable uh, to those people who have a low income, so the connectivity in the CG can go to those neglected areas also. Other things which we are, of course, coming up is the, the, the cybersecurity threats and all those things. This is itself a big, uh, itself is, is a separate topic. But all these things need to be considered in our wireless communications, uh, new product which we are developing for 5G and 6Gs. And keeping in view those things, if we see from the energy efficiency point of view, let's first look on the terrestrial networks. The terrestrial network generally from uh, legacy stuff, we divide it into two things, access and the backhaul. Access could be the cellular 
or it could be the fixed wireless access and the backhaul could be short haul and the long haul. But just now we are seeing the, the heterogeneous networks and all those things where the access and the backhaul are merging together. The functionalities are merging together. That will definitely have a positive impact on the energy efficiency and those things. The functionality of the radio and the access is splitting the remote radio units and of course the baseband and all those things. So you need another connectivity with the front haul. And all these things are moving in a directions we are, we are trying to improve the connectivities, but there are a lot of opportunities to uh, basically improve the energy efficiency. IoT networks, a lot of activities are going on to basically detect something, then communicate it, then analyze it, make a decision and execute it. Now, all these functions need some energy at every level. So we need to be basically be focused at all that different levels. Now, if you see from the HC point of view, the uh, the assessment of the mobile networks uh, as, as, as a network level is just the summation of all the components. It is, if you see on my right-hand side, this equation, this is the energy consumption. It includes the base stations also, it includes the small cells also, which are the, the infrastructure, which is on the base station energy consumption, backhaul, uh, data centers is another source where the lot of energy is being consumed. Uh, the, the, the data center could be remote, data center could be basically in the near vicinity. All those components need to be added. So all, the summation of all these components comes when you add them, then that is called the energy efficiency of the networks. It is not just one antenna or one product. And this is what we need to keep in mind, uh, uh, that how to basically compute the energy efficiency of your network based on the, the radio access technology as per one mobile network operators. Uh, for the non-terrestrial networks, uh, uh, Curvalex has got the uh, DNA of the satellite communication. So we are also, uh, in the satellite communication segments. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of activities are going on. There are some challenges, some opportunities. Uh, I think because of the time, I will not go quite a lot in this. I will just move forward. But uh, I will just uh, say that one of the limitation of, the, of the, the, the link budget, of course, here, and we know that the EIRP has a direct correlation with the use of the energy, right? Energy consumptions that how many devices you are using, how many de and what type of devices you are using, and what IC technology you are using, the gallium arsenide or GAN, and plus right from your baseband to the up conversion and the beam forming, then the power amplifier and the receiving part, the low noise amplifier, all these are definitely at the payload. And for the uh, aerial vehicles, there are two sources of the power consumption. One is the propulsion, other is the communications. Uh, and then, of course, the cooling is also very important because if the cooling is not good, it reduces the efficiency. And of course, there is more energy consumptions and the power of the system will not be that sufficient. And there are many opportunities also. And we are working in that area, especially in the antenna design, beam shaping and the phase arrays. Uh, and we are, and the other benefit of, of course, the, the unmanned aerial vehicles is you can move that thing as per the capacity requirements. But remember in the low, uh, low earth orbit satellites, let's suppose the constellation of the satellite, uh, there are challenges also the base uh, terminal because the satellite is moving and you need to have an antenna which can have a, a connectivity all the time. So it means some electromechanical or some phased array technologies so that you're always connected with one of the satellite in the LEO constellations. Uh, now, in keeping in view all those things, we are working in different areas. We are working in Curvalex, how to increase the spectral efficiencies, different modulation scheme, the MCS factor, spatial efficiency. A lot of work is going on on the antenna side. Uh, bandwidth and higher frequencies is also we are moving into different frequency band, higher frequency bands, and a lot of work is going on for the low side lobe level uh, to improve the CORI and multi-band operations and having a software defined antennas and software defined uh, networks. These are the th main things. Uh, we are also in the Wi-Fi areas and plus the 5G uh, millimeter wave frequency regions where we are working. Uh, in that case, uh, Wi-Fi 6 to Wi-Fi 6E now, where you can use the 6 gigahertz and then Wi-Fi 7 products, uh, where you can do the, the multi-link operation, you can cascade the 6 gigahertz and you can use a very high band channels. So all these things are moving forward. Uh, the base station connectivity, which was mostly at RF, has gone to the microwave. 
and the backhaul, which was in microwave, has gone to the millimeter wave, and soon on the terahertz and all those things. So there's a lot of work, is and each has got his own challenges and opportunities. Uh, from the opportunities point of view, uh, definitely the heterogeneous networks, which is another areas where you can share the resources, low power consumption, as I mentioned earlier, selection of your component and your design strategies, hybrid networks, which I discussed, terrestrial and non-terrestrial, antenna technology, which is high antenna efficiency in the beam forming. This is one of our key area in which we are working. And apart from this, uh, from the data center point of view, the, the, power, the power usage efficiencies, how much power is really used for the IT devices as compared to how much power is used for the other structures. So all these factors are important for the green digital networks. And we are one of the main activity which we are doing is going from a single beam antenna to the multi-beam antennas, which we are using the phased array antenna technology. So if you see in this slide, what we are doing it, that we are basically covering one sector instead of a one beam with the multiple beam. Uh, in this product, we are talking about the 16 beams. Uh, and in the 16 beams is, uh, uh, or it could be the eight, uh, 16 beams in eight direction or 16 beam in 16 direction, depending upon the dual polarized and using the MIMO. Now we have done uh, uh, 16 beam in eight direction and using the XPIC MIMO. This is how, what we are doing it, just assume there are the pipes are running narrow pipes and we are reducing the interference and this is the way to increase the capacity. This is the technology which we are already using and the product is already deployed in many countries. Uh, for the phased array antenna technology for sub six gigahertz, we are also working in the millimeter waves. And in this way, basically this is the product where we have got the phased array antenna technology sub six uh, based on Wi-Fi six. Now we have moved to the Wi-Fi 6E and soon we will move to Wi-Fi 7 also. Uh, we are merging the base uh, uh, 5G technology with the Wi-Fi technologies and we are coming up uh, new systems for the millimeter wave, which is the 5G frequencies and also above uh, with the multi-beam solution for the access point and CPEs. All these will provide connectivities and, and these all are energy efficient designs. For example, here you can all run this system using a solar panel, which means those countries where the power is not available, uh, this can be deployed because the less power uh, consumptions, definitely the solutions will be more sustainable. Uh, and we are also working on a satellite uh, ground terminals with our partner Freefall. Uh, as I mentioned just now, that in the LEO, the most important thing is uh, uh, make before, before break, because there are about eight satellite or 11 satellite, depending upon the, the constellation, depending upon the latitude, depending on the coverage. Uh, you need to look at one and one satellite at a time and then move to the other satellite. The general prior art is people are using uh, two parabolic antennas and they are moving, the whole parabolic antenna is moving. Uh, to track the satellite. But what we have done, this is a novel idea where this, the reflector is static and we are using the two feeds. And the two feeds are moving up and down and left and right. And they are always uh, uh, select, uh, selected one satellite in the orbit and from one horizon to the other horizon. So it is covering the full sky. And this can provide you a very low cost and energy efficient solution. Because if you are having a two uh, uh, system, uh, power consumption about 500 watts, you can do it with one system, which means about 250 watts. So straight away power consumption, weight, cost, everything is reduced because this design, there's another product which we have developing now, which is embedded on a ground to have more zoning friendly. This is the two spherical reflectors, uh, basically scanning and looking all around the sky and provide the connectivities from the low earth orbit satellite at a remote locations. And these all can run on a solar panel. And from here, you can use the other system of the fixed wireless access and provide the connectivity to the grounds. So basically we are working in both, uh, in the fixed wireless terrestrial and also for the ground terminals. And the main objective is here is to have a sustainable solutions with a low power consumptions and something which can provide a gigabit connectivity through wireless because that was a dilemma that this can only be provided by uh, optical fiber. So this is the main activities which we are following at the moments. And of course, this all work is going to in line with the, with the sustainable solutions. And this is the main core of, the, of, uh, of this company. And we are doing it. In other words, we are just uh, moving forward and let's join hands 
with a mission of bringing the sustainable solution to our world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeanette. That was a fascinating talk. I'm sure we have many questions, but I'd like to ask you to take the questions over the chat, if that's okay. Yes. Um, and uh, j just to, to make sure that we don't run out of time. Um, thank you very much for that. So please go ahead and ask the question. I have a couple of questions for you that I will post on the chat shortly. And I would like to uh, welcome Halim, if you're available. Yes, I am here. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. So uh, Professor Halim Yaniko Merolu, um, who will be talking to us about the new non-terrestrial networks. Uh, Halim is a Chancellor's Professor at the Carleton University in Canada. So please, whenever you're ready, if you could share your screen. And there were already some questions about non-terrestrial networks. So this, uh, this is just perfect timing. Um, uh, Mona, do you see it in one slide at a time or two? One slide at the moment. Sure. So uh, should I start then? Yes, please. Whenever you're ready. Thank you yes. so much. Well, uh, it is such a delight to be part of this program. And I would like to thank Mona, yourself, and as well as Ariane and Mohammed uh, for the invitation. Um, uh, in the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes, we will go through a forward-looking construct, and that is the non-terrestrial networks. This discussion is not new, but I will be saying different things, hopefully, therefore the title new NTN discussion. Well, this discussion is not confined to 6G because 6G is around the corner uh, from a long-term research perspective, for the first time, this discussion is becoming tangible with a solid framework, and it will continue, in my view, um, several decades without being an exaggeration. It's very interesting times, therefore. And when we say NTN, implicitly, we mean that we have an integrated overall one network with the terrestrial components as well. I will unpack that as we move forward. And when we say NTN, most people understand exclusively satellite networks. However, there is much more to that story, the lesser known parts in stratosphere. Therefore, I will focus mainly on the stratospheric component of uh, non-terrestrial networks. And once you have such a network, actually you can do much more than connectivity connectivity becomes one of the possible use cases. Um, and furthermore, we should not tie NTN to rural and remote. That is as well a use case, but, but rural and remote is not where the activity, where the money is. NTN has things to offer first and foremost in the metro areas where the population is, where the industry is, where the money is. Um, I will start by positioning NTN with respect to 6G. A very brief uh, mention of satellite mega constellations. Uh, the previous presenter already mentioned about those, but I will focus on the less known component, high altitude platform station networks, uh, and then we will move forward. Now, it is quite a common buzzword, 6G NTN. Uh, however, it has quite a bit of history, although we were not calling it NTN. Uh, but if you go to 90s, as soon as GSM became a success, people were talking about integrated GSM satellite networks. And every generation, we had that discussion without necessarily much success, but once again, now it is the time we are making that discussion in a tangible manner, and it is only the start. If you go to Google Images, as I did, and type 6G, so many nice view graphs come up, gigabit per second connectivity, and so on. But the reality is, in Canada, if I take the train from national capital, Ottawa, to the biggest city, Toronto, and mind you, this is a G8 country, 
just north of the US border, at least one third of the tracks, I will not have any signal, let alone gigabit per second connectivity. I can't send an SMS signal to start with. So today, uh, or when in the context of 6G, we are mentioning all these cool applications, augmented reality and so on, but that happens only if you are close to the network and network really does not exist in most of the land. 6G uh, framework was established by ITU June earlier this year. Now this is the very uh, famous uh, one of the two diagrams that ITU came up with. On the below side in green colors, we show uh, the incremental enhancements of 6G in comparison to 5G. So there are the usual KPIs like latency, like rate, and they get better. There is no surprise on that part. But the interesting part, something we are discussing for the very first time is the upper part shown in blue. We are talking about now coverage, ubiquitous coverage. It is not sufficient anymore to have the network in big cities alone. You, you have to have coverage everywhere. And we are talking about sensing, sustainability, interoperability. All of them can be read as NTN. So NTN will be a very um, important paradigm, uh, not only in 6G, but moving forward towards 2050s. Satellite mega constellations, we are all very fascinated. It was a bit of a shock in 2018, 19, when we start hearing about Starlink. But uh, I think everyone is fairly familiar about satellite mega constellations. Therefore, I will move right away to what is happening in stratosphere. According to ITU's definition, HAPS is a fixed object in stratosphere 20 to 50 kilometers, but most of the activity is on the lower part of stratosphere that is 20 kilometers. So it, it is some sort of aircraft at a fixed point relative to earth. That is, it is not orbiting unlike satellite networks. And then it uh, basically provides connectivity and other services. Um, in, in the diagram here, there are different types of aircrafts are shown in the older days, balloon would be the rudimentary aircraft type, but not a very small balloon, maybe 60, 70 meters in height. Anyhow, the current and upcoming projects are uh, very much aircraft design focused. There are uh, gliders, uh, zeppelins, and much more advanced uh, blimps, if I may say. Also, uncrewed airplanes working with hydrogen fuel, all these are possibilities as aircraft type. And mind you, 20 kilometers is about the air, airline routes and about the uh, inclement weather activities. Um, so ITU's interest in HAPS is not a new story. As a matter of fact, since 1990s, ITU has been uh, allocated dedicated spectrum for HAPS applications for rural and remote coverage. That's the bottom line. But that dedicated spectrum itself has been in many ways um, a roadblock for the development of HAPS due to the fact that when you have dedicated spectrum, you have dedicated equipment, dedicated air interface, basically this is a separate network than terrestrial network. Who wants to carry multiple devices? One for HAPS, another for satellite, another for terrestrial. It really <laughs> did not take off and it couldn't show it as potential, this paradigm, mainly due to the fact that, again, it was envisioned historically as a standalone network for rural and co uh, remote coverage. We have to put aside that viewpoint. So uh, in my group and with my collaboration collaborators, as a matter of fact, uh, Professor Mohamed Zishan Shakir and I did some earlier work 
in this area a number of years ago. Um, our envisioning is that uh, this is a multi-tier network and stratosphere is just a native extension of the terrestrial network. So on the ground, you have small base stations, macro base stations, and then uh, in the air, if I may say, or in the stratosphere, we have a super macro base station. That's a term I coined, and this integrated network, I uh, sometimes call in my publications as a vertical headnet. As we know, headnet refers to the multi type of access points. In terrestrial networks, now we have a vertical uh, heterogeneous uh, network. How do we differentiate HAPS with respect to both terrestrial and satellite networks? First of all, in comparison to LEOs, which are about 500 kilometers above, uh, uh, HAPS is much closer, only 20 kilometers. And even LTE air interface allows communications with that distance. So direct to device is uh, in many ways quite straightforward when we are talking about HAPS. It is non-orbiting, therefore you don't need to track anything. You don't need very complicated phase arrays on the user side. HAPS is huge. Uh, this diagram showing a, a Zeppelin is about 135 meters by 65 meters. Since it is huge, it can carry a lot of equipment and you can do much more with them. For instance, cameras uh, in addition to connectivity. And this is first and foremost for urban and suburban regions and it can be extended to rural and remote. In short, we are talking about an integrated terrestrial, non-terrestrial network in an harmonized spectrum, one air interface, one device, one network. That is the bottom line. Here is a view graph from one of my magazine papers in this area. Um, consider a city like Ottawa, where I am. Um, in the skies, there is a HAPS or a HAPS cluster. If it is a cluster, they are connected to each other with a super high rate, uh, laser interhaps inter links. And then you can create different types of beams um, for hotspots, very narrow beams for wide area coverage, wide beams for users on the ground, for users in the air like cargo drones, for backhauling of small cells. There was a question in the chat for the uh, previous uh, speaker without going much into detail. Zishan and I, and uh, Mohammed Al Zanat, a PhD student at the time, wrote a magazine paper about backhauling uh, small cells on the ground with HAPS um, in 2018 or 19 communications magazine. And I got, uh, and that got the um, uh, best paper award uh, from IEEE. Now, imagine I have this infrastructure in stratosphere. Um, even more important than connectivity, it might be very helpful for surveillance, monitoring, sensing. Just imagine a time where cars do not have license plates in front and back, but on the rooftops, uh, not necessarily seen by naked eye, but can be seen with infrared and other technologies. Any traffic infringement instantaneously can be detected. And now put, Atomic clocks here in the in the HAPS localization, positioning, navigation becomes centimeter accurate. Today we use medium Earth orbit satellites at 20,000, 30,000 kilometers. Imagine what we can achieve at only 20 kilometers. And um, as a kind of uh, continuation of the previous talk, this network can be very energy efficient because you wouldn't need to densify the terrestrial network unnecessarily. I can have many beams in stratosphere and as the demand on the ground appear, those beams can be turned on and off. 
This is what I was uh, mentioning. It uh, helps enables a centralized massive access capacity and I can divert that capacity to wherever is needed and whenever is needed. So imagine here, this is showing um, in Ottawa, let us say, multiple HAPS beams. Um, if I have IoT to devices to collect in a radius of 100 kilometers, I have this big beam. But if I have very narrow beams, I can create hot spots on the ground. Imagine this green dot as a uh, connected autonomous tourist bus. 100 people, each person is a network. Collectively, it requires terabits per second connectivity in 2030s or 40s. Now, rather than densifying uh, that suburban area so that this bus would always be close to an access point, that is not a good design. That is over-engineering. That is a lot of capex, a lot of opex, a lot of energy consumption. I can rather uh, turn on a beam from HAPS and as bus moves, that beam can track uh, the load. So excellent for supply demand matching in networks. Every generation offered about two orders of magnitude enhancement in aggregate capacity. Now in 6G, we are mentioning possibly up to terabits per second. Therefore, it is only a matter of time. We would be talking about 100 terabits per second in 7G times of 2040s. And this is doable with the HAPS. Why I am saying that? Because as we speak today, we have high altitude, sorry, high throughput satellites like Viasat 3 at geo altitude, which has 1000 beams and in aggregate, they can offer terabits per second capacity. If we are able to do that from 35,000 kilometers, most likely we should be able to do that from 20 kilometers, actually much better, up to 100 terabits per second in 2040 timeframe. So in many ways, HAPS can utilize the very best technologies both from terrestrial and satellite networks. Another uh, view graph from some of my magazine papers um, in the skies of whether it is Glasgow or Ottawa, a cluster of HAPS, again, tied to each other with laser links, and then they have different beam types. They are offering uh, services for a variety of use cases, including backhauling whenever necessary. And um, that cluster is tied to, for instance, Montreal cluster, which is only 200 kilometers away, and also to the satellite network. This is an int integrated architecture. It is much more than access. Here we are talking about backhaul, edge computing, which I didn't really have time to get into, transport, core functionalities. You can have uh, functionalities of a, a data center in stratosphere. So it is once again, more than communications. Probably the first applications might be in uh, reconnaissance, surveillance, um, uh, a lot to offer when it comes to sensing as well. I anticipate that by 2050, we will have somewhere between 10,000 to 100,000 HAPs globally uh, providing service for all use cases. This is really transformative. And if we are thinking about the future smart cities and societies which are green and sustainable, there are really three enablers, sensors everywhere, on the ground, underground, in the air, computing is through AI and when the time comes quantum, and then the architecture that connects all of them is this uh, integrated terrestrial HAPS LEO architecture. It is a zero touch network, zero second setup time, beams are on off instantly. Reporting in progress. And uh, okay. it is uh, uh, practically there is no outage.
Um, just another example, let us say that in outskirts of Glasgow or Ottawa, there is a big concert, 50,000 people come together for an afternoon. Well, how can you provide service to that crowd? Don't worry. Our HAPS network is there. As you see, the beams can be turned on and off opportunistically and uh, do the job. So the fact that we have a bird's eye line of sight view of a large area, and in that large area, I can divert the capacity wherever I want is a big advantage. Uh, HAPS has a big surface area, I should mention. It is also very conducive for technologies like very advanced antenna architectures and also reconfigurable intelligent services. The bottom line is nothing is wasted. All the resources, whether it, whether it is computing, storage, antennas, they are centralized uh, at a pool. Um, and this has applications. Um, so many imagine uh, an, uh, an autonomous and connected vehicle paradigm in a highway or in an extended uh, city area, rather than making handoffs continuously with the roadside units, at least the control channels can be moved to HAPS without any handoff, a, a vehicle can travel 100 kilometers. And really a nice uh, example here, if you want to do uh, construct the digital twin of Glasgow, why collect data from 500 small base stations? The HAPS can see the entire city in one shot. Very suitable application. So green, sustainable, future cities, HAPS is the way to go. And just to wrap up, I cannot think of a better example than the Saudi Neom City, a trillion dollar project for 2030s and 40s. I got these view graphs from internet, but I put my HAPS without HAPS, it will be incomplete this uh, futuristic construct. Um, I will actually skip the research directions at the interest of time. I have 20 slides for them at the very end as appendix. Just I will say a couple of words here. At Carlton University, we have a, a big team uh, also with our collaborators working on various aspects of this new paradigm uh, from antenna architectures to interference management, to propagation, sensing, navigation. Uh, cybersecurity is obviously big. Uh, if that infrastructure is jeopardized, the consequences are really dire and so on. I have to say that there are many challenges outside, let us say, connectivity paradigm or um, an extended connected paradigm, uh, which are more related to aerospace industry, such as building an, a high endurance aircraft with high loitering time, but also energy. For 6G type of applications, like a super macro base station, um, uh, the 5G base station energy consumption or power rating is around 12 kilowatts. That can be done with energy from sun, with photovoltaic cells, but if you are talking about much bigger functionalities, then you would need more energy. And in that case, some more creative techniques will be necessary. Um, I have uh, quite many uh, vision papers in this area. All of them are magazine papers, a dozen or more since 2021. Uh, a number of them are in uh, under review. You can check my website or this slide deck and also more technical papers. Um, for instance, our most recent work, as you see, some new antenna designs, advanced massive MIMO architectures for uh, HAPS construct or uh, uh, federated learning. Um, again, uh, federated learning is very heavy on backhaul if you do that across small cells, but if you do that in one shot rather than in a hierarchical manner, it results in a lot of efficiency. I will leave these as well and just move to my final few slides. 
So what we are talking about here is not a single technology which would stay active for five, six years and then we will move on to something else. No, we are talking about a plethora of plethora of technologies from physical layer to networking and AI is a big enabler. Pretty much whatever technology you can think of in ICT, it will be an enabler in this new um, infrastructure and the returns are unprecedented. Sometimes people find it a bit odd when you talk about a brand new network between terrestrial network and satellite network, but I ask why not? We already have 5,000 plus satellites as we speak in only Starlink mega constellation. And uh, if we can do this in space, I have reasons to think that we can do this much better in stratospheres. If you are interested, just type my name in YouTube. I have a YouTube channel with some cool videos. And if you would like to work in this area, um, here is my email. I would be happy to continue with the conversation. Let me end there. And based on the questions, I might show some of the uh, backup slides on different research directions. Thank you, Mona. Thank you very much. That was a brilliant talk. Great, great. So I'd like to thank you again for an amazing talk and for all the questions and answers. And I'd like to hand over to Zishan. Well, thank you so much, uh, Muna. And thank you so much, Professor Halim, for this very interesting talk.